Hi guys, my name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Another week, another episode. I hope you had a brilliant week. Um, I had a week full of meetings, meetings, meetings. I'm trying to realign and reconstitute the people that I will need to take my vision to the next level in the next two to five years. So this is meeting a lot of people, chit-chatting, that type of thing. <laughs> It wasn't such a heavy week. Oh, I got to hang out with my next door neighbor's kid a lot who has now learned my name. So you may, if he's around today, hear him shouting my name. (laughs) So it's going to be a bit of a difference in the background noise you're used to. So anyway, yeah, um, but at the end of the week, I had a really important meeting, you know, one of those that could really either change your life or just break your spirit. (laughs) Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I went for dinner at um, the owner of one of the longest running magazines in Kenya. And it was around the time I was doing the African Women in Media Conference. So we went a bunch of us and it was just fun times just women hanging out talking about the industry talking about um the different challenges we've had it was really good and so she then began talking about the issues that she had faced in her magazine you know with the disruption of the digital world and just businesses having to evolve anyway so she it felt like she was hinting that you know me and her should work together but i was just like oh my god am i really I'm um, skilled enough to do this. But there was another lady at the dinner. Her name is Mariam. Shout out to her. She pulled me aside at a point and she was like, oh my God, I've just met you today, but I genuinely think you're the right person to be able to work with this woman in the next phase of her business. And it was really nice of her to do that because she doesn't know me, right? So that's the first night we're meeting. And she, I think, spotted my self-doubt <laughs> and just like nipped it in the bud. And I was just like, man, thank God she did that. And so if you're listening, you are in an opportunity to do that for somebody else, please do. Because self-doubt can be so crippling. My God, you walk into a room and you're just feeling like you're underqualified to be there. Or sometimes, and especially for creatives, you feel like whatever you create comes so easily to you that you don't give it the respect or the credit of how amazing it is you know what i mean so if it's not something that that's certified on a paper it's something that you create and just flows from within you almost downplay it i do that a lot so yeah i think that was what was happening in the moment anyway so back to this past week um i i I had a meeting with the lady and it went really well Um, I was really scared at first because it's one of those meetings that could either end beautifully and you have a new challenge or could just break your spirit. (laughs) And you come back home and you get under the covers and you just weep or force yourself to sleep. But it went really well. What was also interesting during the meeting, she told me that back in the day, I think I was about, what, 12 or 13 She interviewed my late mom in her magazine and my mom opened up about her divorce and, you know, the issues she was going through with my dad. And she handled that story. Yeah, she handled my mom's story. So that was so interesting. It's like life coming full circle. It's just so weird. It was one of those things that happen. You're like, oh, that's interesting. (laughs) Anyway, funny enough though, as far as the Legally Clueless feature 100 African Stories is concerned, I try and pre-record a bunch of them and then I just edit them weekly. The story for today's episode, I have been putting off editing just because it hits so close to home. And it's the story of Edgar. And Edgar opens up about childhood trauma. So this story, we sat down to speak and we ended up speaking for close to two hours, guys. So the story is going to be in two parts because I really believe every aspect of it is very important. I've known Edgar for a very long time. We first met when I was in St. Mary's for IB. I think it was a year behind me. And we used the same school bus. And when we started going out clubbing, there were times that he would um, come clubbing with us. And I'd always joke about it that he was the one guy who my mom allowed to sleep over at her house once, right? After a night out. 
And I thought it was because my late mom knew his mom. So it was easy in that aspect because I was just like, hey, my mom is allowing a member of the opposite sex <laughs> to be in the house. How? No, but um, I remember this one time and it only happened once. We came back from the club and so he slept over at our house. And then in the morning after breakfast, blah, 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 he went home. And hearing him open up about the violence that was happening in his house took me back to that moment. And I was like, oh, that's why you didn't want to go home because his home was not that far from ours. And I did feel a bit of guilt. Like I never once asked if he was okay but he was always so happy and cheerful so i never saw any red flags in the moment to ask if everything was okay but also i think his story reminded me a lot about my own childhood my dad who also passed away in 2007 was a really horrible and abusive husband and he was very violent on many occasions and i remember as a kid thinking whenever my dad would come home from work in the evenings, I would be silently praying that that evening wouldn't be a violent one. And so I'm so thankful that my mom was courageous enough to leave my dad because now that I think back to it, that was my normal, right? Because I'd never lived in a home that wasn't like that. So that was my normal. But in hindsight, I'm like, "Mm, that is not a very conducive environment for anyone, child or grown up, to be in. So that's why I'm so thankful for my mom being courageous enough to leave my dad and leave with three kids. You know, I have to figure out how she was going to pay their school fees. Of course, my mom's side of the family is very supportive. So we moved in with an auntie and uncle for a while. And so they were very helpful in that respect. But I can just imagine that it wasn't the most easiest of decisions she had to make, but I am so thankful she did. First, it shortened the amount of time that we were exposed to that environment. And then, because my late mom was somebody who was very open and she would explain her decisions, it allowed me to be very aware of why she decided to do this. We could openly have conversations on that so that helps you kind of be very conscious about the childhood trauma and how it could manifest later in your life and you're able to spot it in time yeah it's just one of those things that i whenever i think back i am always so thankful because i know how hard it must have been for my mom but i'm always so thankful that she decided to divorce my dad so when i was editing Edgar's story, it just really awakened a consciousness in me about childhood trauma. And in the caption, you will find the WhatsApp number. And I want you to send an audio note or a WhatsApp voice note, whatever you call it, about childhood trauma you experienced or maybe you witnessed and how conscious you are of the effects it's had on you. So do you do things in a particular way because of the childhood trauma that you experienced? Or do you just completely blank it out completely and you just never want to go back to that time of your life? As you're recording those WhatsApp audio notes and voice notes, just send it to me because I'll include them in next week's episode. But I want you to listen to part one of Edgar's story. It really, it hits close to home and it explains so powerfully how childhood trauma can just manifest throughout your life. I mean, for him, it was from when he was 10 and now he's 31. And at least now he's able to identify it. But those are many years. Those are many years. Yeah, here's part one of Edgar's story. A hundred African stories. There is no proper life that you live in university as a musician. If I constantly just walked around feeling sorry for myself, I'm never going to get anything done. Uh, there was a bit of frustration in between all of that. I've been breaking my back for this company. Therapy is not for the weak or for the crazy. Stories from Africa. My name is Edgar Odiambo. I live in Nairobi, Kenya and um, 31 years old. Something I struggled with for a very long time, which is being voiceless or feeling like I am voiceless. This probably started when, actually my probably my whole life, 
uh, but where it where it uh, I feel it began where I started noticing it was when I was about 10 and now what happened was there was a cousin of uh, not a cousin actually my auntie of mine my mom's younger sister uh, she came over to the house one Saturday morning uh, with an in-law of hers mm. it was upon my mom's request but I found out now when you know they, they already reached the house my mom had something to talk to them about it looked like it was concerning an incident that had happened after that my mom asked me to accompany her to Kenyatta Market. We never used to live far from Kenyatta Market. We used to live in Gumo. So it was the market just, you know, up the road where we used to buy our groceries, our meat for the house. Our aunties gave us a lift and then immediately we, we got there, we dropped, we dropped, we, we got out of the car. I'm near side walking towards the market, but my mom tells me, hey, you know, stop, slow down, turn around. We're walking back home. So for me, I'm just like, but I thought we were going to, you know, the, the market to buy stuff. She's like, no, 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 no. I just need to talk to you about something and I need to talk to you outside the house. Uh, which I felt was weird mm-hmm. because we didn't have, there's no one at home. Mm-hmm. My dad had already left that day. Uh, I don't know what he had gone to do, but then my sister was really young mm-hmm. at that time. So easily you could have told her, go play outside or whatever. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I guess just my, my mom's way of, you know, telling me this story. So she now tells me, hey, yo, Edgar. So something happened last night. So I'm like, hey. What what happened? And uh, she tells me, I, your dad and I got into an argument, and that argument got a bit heated, and you know, uh, he hit me. So I'm like, okay, you know, I'm ten. I'm like, of course, I'm shocked. I'm like, hey, why would dad hit mom? Like, you know. But she goes on to say that uh, the reason why we were having the argument is she had found out some stuff my dad had been doing outside. The, the the marriage mm. that wasn't uh, rubbing off very well with my mom. I just listened to her vent the whole way home, which was like, because we walked pretty slow. So we took, it's sort of a, I mean, it usually takes like a 15 minute walk, but we ended up taking like about 35. <laughs> so we get we get home and then my mom tells me, hey, no, not my mom, I told her, like, you know, mom, let me tell you, this thing you've told me today will come and affect me one day. I don't know what made me say that, until today, every time I keep saying this story, I always tell people, I don't know what made me say that, mm-hmm. but it came to be true years later. You know, after this situation, of course, it got me looking at my dad very differently. And now what started happening was my mom started telling me every little thing my dad did that she was not happy with. If it had something that he had done directly or if it's something that an in-law had done, she always told me. And then now on my dad's side, he has temperaments that sometimes we never we never knew how to take in. You know, one day he's happy and then the next time he's angry and we never really knew how to gauge him. So a lot of the time because uh, he was angry, I used to back off, you know, uh, back off him, be very distant with him. Uh, but I mean, you no, know, we are kids, we're going to school. So school helped because majority of the time you're not with your parents, you're with your friends, you know, your classmates and all that. And then now on weekends is where if we're not going anywhere as a family, you know, you're around the estate with your friends playing, all that. Uh, but now picture like a day after school, you know, you've uh, come home, uh, you have homework to do and you still want to squeeze in some time to play. So you're thinking, okay, what do I do? So of course, there's sometimes if you get moments within... Uh, your day in school, you try and do a little bit of your homework. Mm-hmm. So that by the time you get home and someone asks you, have you done your homework? Like, yeah, 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 I've done, I've done. Check, 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 man, me, it's, it's over. But, you know, you get time to play. Now it's started with small, small things. Like, math was a really difficult subject for me growing up. My dad is a guru in math, man. This guy loves math. It's something that in his profession he does, you know, uh, he faces so every day. I go to him one time and I'm like, yo, dad, I'm having trouble with this math problem. Could you please help me? And He's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? How can you not know what the answer of this is? Didn't you, did, didn't you listen when you're in class? Why didn't you listen to the teacher? Um, how come you didn't grasp what the teacher was teaching you? Why are we paying school fees? Mm. And the thing is, you can't be expected to know everything, no matter, irrespective of your age. Mm. At that time now, I'm like, yo, I just came to ask for, I know, uh, help in my homework. Mm. Uh, and you're the girl who's an expert in math. So, hey... Just, just help me so I can learn now and then tomorrow I don't need to come to you asking for help. I'll probably come into you telling you, you remember that problem I had last week with the math, pro- with the, with math, math homework? I, after you taught me, I learned it and goddamn, I got it, mm-hmm. you know? But that didn't happen. Uh, so what I started doing is avoiding 
asking for help when I really needed it. So here I am, I'm like, okay, I want to be helped with my homework. I can't ask. So it made learning in class very difficult for me because even asking my teacher for help was a problem. Asking friends for help was a problem because I always had that presumption that when I ask for help, I'll be shouted at. I'll be made to feel that, I mean, how do you not know this? You know, you're, you're, you're silly or you're foolish for not knowing, you know, the answer to uh, these questions. The moments where I remember we had a, a, a houseboy. He's the one who from time to time helped me with my homework. Oh, wow. You know, he was that guy. He was like, no, sit, I'll teach you what I can. And where he, what, what he knew, you know, uh, he helped. Where he, he didn't know, he just told me, oh, unfortunately, I don't know. We'll have to find another way around it. But he never, he never told me to, you know, he kept telling me, don't worry, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. Don't give up, you know, don't, don't be discouraged, which was really cool. And then now, you know, you're growing older and um, there's my mom telling me about my dad and the things he's going through. Uh, that she's going through with him. And then there's my dad being angry and taking out that anger on me. So he's probably been pissed off by something or someone else, but it's end up being taken out on me, you know? And then, so I'd go to my mom and like, oh, mom, you know, why don't we, you know, uh, do things in another way so that we avoid all this? Like, no, 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 Edgar, you don't understand, you don't understand, you don't know, you don't know. One day you'll grow up and you'll understand. So that already, that response, I mean, my intentions are good. You know, I want to help, you know, my mom and, you know, what she's going through. But it was always taken that I didn't know. So that got me again to keep being silent. And then on my dad's side, you want to say something, but you're never sure about the response you'll get. I'd want to hang out with my friends. Uh, weekend, splash, carnival, those are the places that we liked going to. I need to ask my dad, you know, can I go for this plan with these friends? Uh, and if you agree... Could I have some money? Because I mean, I'm young, I'm not working, so. And I didn't know how to do that because there's maybe once or twice that I'd ask and the response I'm met with just gets me to back away completely. I'd have to go through my mom or through my sister who was, who was four years my junior. Uh, so that should show you, you know, that when I say that I'm, I was voiceless, I didn't know how mm. to ask for the most, you know, menial of things. Yeah. You know, it was always such a big task for me. So it was better to just keep quiet. I go tell my mom, oh, you know, uh, I'm not happy with one, two, three things. And it was immediately switched to make it about her. So it was like, oh, you're saying that? What about me? And me, let me tell you. And me, let me tell you. So my feelings were always sort of dismissed. And the times that maybe they were listened to a bit, they were invalidated. So I didn't have... Uh, uh, an upbringing where my guardians protected me uh, and taught me about how to handle myself in the society. Mm-hmm. It was always with a command yeah. and a, a very strict command, you know, and then also a lot of comparison. You know, you're being told, oh, you know, you, you're here, you're just playing. What about, you know, look at your class, you look at your friends out there, them, they're home, they're reading, mm-hmm. you know, they're probably going to pass the exams. You, you're just only going to, you know, happen, what's going to happen to you is just, you're going to be a watchman, you're going to be uh, a guest, a cleaner and all that. So I think in their own way, uh, especially my mom is always to do this a lot. It was like a scare tactic to get me to be focused on my books. But those are underlined issues. The reason why I was not focused so much on my books is because I didn't know how to handle all this stuff. Mm. You know, the teacher has come, the, imp- the teachers are impacting so much knowledge, teaching me, you know, whatever subject it was. Yeah. And I'm trying to take in all this knowledge and I'm panicking. Yeah. I don't know how to take it all, but I don't know who to tell. Because the people that I would like to tell are not very approachable. So I'm stuck with myself, who is a young kid, doesn't know much about life. I'm still learning so much with regard to school. So what am I going to do? It's not that I wasn't smart. My emotional needs were not taken care of as they should. Because, I mean, again, I was young. Uh, the people who, you know, uh, are said to know better because they've lived longer. You know, the way people like putting it, you know, because I've lived X amount of years and you're still young. Yeah. I, I know more. I know. I know. I've been through this before. But... Again, dynamics change. So it was so difficult, man. At home, things weren't too good because there's a lot of in-house fighting between my folks. Yeah. And a lot of that was being uh, taken out on me in different ways. But no one ever cared to ask, 
Edgar, are you okay? Is what's happening at home affecting you in any way? Is it is this a reason why you're not able to be focused in class? Is this a reason why maybe when you're with your friends, you know, there's, you know, you have maybe you had an outburst with one, you you know, you took a situation a bit too far mm-hmm. and, you know, you you maybe pissed off or hurt a friend of yours, uh, either physically or emotionally. No, I never asked, you know, so no, I never knew. People just assumed this guy is fine, this guy is fine. This, of course, went on and into my high school. Again, I want to go for a plan with my friends. I need some money because I need I have to go and socialize with guys. You know, this is a time where now you're, you're, you're a teenager, yeah. uh, things are changing, you know, you start talking to girls here and there, these random concerts that were there, you know, cashers, name it. I want to go for all these things, but again, I can't. Talking to girls was a big problem. My <laughs> God. You know, this day and age, I, I, I think now when I tell guys that I'm generally a very shy person. Yeah. People don't believe because people look at my personality and like you're so extroverted, like you're so out there. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm out there, but put me in specific situations, you will see another side of me. Throw me in a situation where I need to just go and say hi to that girl and ask her how she's doing. And so you know, growing up, get tell you, hey, I was vibing a mama. You know, Jenna, hey, I had, a, I vibed this mama. She even gave me her number. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I think vibing was like this very technical thing that only a certain caliber of people who who knew how to do it. Yeah. So I always felt like an outsider. And mm. you know, I'm like, hey man, this guy, hey, so cool, man. He is able to vibe mamas. Hey, this crew, the guys who can vibe mamas, me. <laughs> I was always the the guy in the corner, the yeah. guy behind the scenes. That's where I, I felt like I belonged. But um, the reason why I felt that way again was just because of the way I was brought up. Okay, I was in an all boys school, so it was good. But you know, we had uh, people in IB. Yeah. You know, the girls. I'm like, okay, yeah. So you just look. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. Someone easily will just come say, "Hi, how are you?" And I'm, mm. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi, hi. And then that's it. You don't know what to say. You get choked up. Yeah. You know. In the east, it was a little easier because most of these girls we'd gone, we'd grown up with them. Mm. But this is the thing, you know, the older you grow, you know, um, there's, you know, body transitions, yeah. there's emotional transitioning that's happening, and you start looking at your neighbor a little differently, and you're like, yo, <laughs> hey, she pretty, or she has a nice body, yes. okay, I think I have a crush on her. Mm-hmm. I was unmatched to the guys who were able to vibe girls. It was default settings, back in my hole, didn't bother. There's these girls in IB who, you know, again, you know, you're looking around, you're like, oh, yeah, she's pretty. Yeah. Oh, my God, she's so cool. Yeah. I like her personality. I think we can click. Like, I see we have a lot of things in common, but nothing. So that goes on. I finish IB. I get to to uni. Now uni is even more complicated. You know, there's, there's vibing a girl. There's getting into relationships with girls, bringing sex and all this. You know, and again, voicelessness comes in again. You know, you don't know how to maneuver. Now it was how to maneuver this um, a little bit more complicated type of relationships. I couldn't, I couldn't talk to my dad. And I remember between form three, my form three and my form four, that was what, 2004, 2005. Mm. My mom kept traveling to the States to be with her sister. Mm. It was high escape Mm. because of the things that we were going through. Or that she was going through in her marriage, which of course spewed over now to um, my my sister and myself. Mm. You know, uh, the environment at home wasn't very good. There's a lot of noise. Mm. Like, I just put that with us. There's a lot of noise. So them constantly arguing here and there, and then um, me being pulled into this in these arguments and mm. the impact that it's had. It was having on both my parents. It was also being taken out on me. Mm. When my mom traveled, I didn't know. I was left with my dad. I don't know how to handle this guy you know because he's this really militant guy and if things are not done the way he wants hell Mm. so we grew very distant and i remember like my ib we barely spoke Mm. you know it was we meet we're living in the same house but in the morning we wake up it's just we pass each other his aunt who used to have to take me to the bus stop and that drive was silent Mm. you know we didn't talk much uh, unless he's asking something to do with my schooling and it's very very brief conversations, you know. Parent-teacher meetings, come, not come, it come, not come. Here I am, I'm a young, you know, I'm a teenager trying to become a young adult, getting to be a young adult, mm-hmm. and I'm facing all these things where how do I approach a girl? 
how do I approach a male count, a male I mean a, a male friend or a male stranger mm-hmm. who I need to uh, be assertive about a certain situation mm-hmm. you know where I need to stand up for myself I didn't know how to do that mm-hmm. so what ended up happening a lot in my life was people taking an advantage of that side of me yes there's the nice part of uh, my persona that stood out very clearly to a lot of people but when it was uh, when I was faced with situations where I needed to stand up for myself and tell someone you've hurt me and I don't like because you know because with what you said or what you did I I I I got hurt I didn't know how to do that you know I just used to keep quiet and people now took advantage of that a lot of guys you say that Edgar okay, you know you're just too nice you're just too nice sometimes you just need to be rough around the edges sometimes mm-hmm. you know i knew i should i didn't know how that looked like so fast forward to 2013 i got the opportunity to fly out to the uk to do my masters mm-hmm. at least where i lived the student accommodation we were including myself we were five kenyans okay. so that that was a good buffer yeah. to sort of get me started in how do i handle you know life in this new country mm-hmm. so that this guys had been there for some time so they told me what to look out for mm-hmm. and all that but it was still difficult so i remember now a lot of what i was going through growing up started catching up with me mm-hmm. and in more complicated situations that i was not able to handle mm-hmm. on my own so i went to the, the 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 school website and i went and i looked at if they offer therapy mm-hmm. and i found that they do so i signed up and i think the first appointment was a month after that day i'd signed up uh so you know something i was looking forward to very much mm-hmm. you know and it was more because i always wanted someone to hear the things that i'd been holding inside because mm-hmm. i overthink so much and i never knew how to articulate what i was going through for me to process and then find healthy ways of dealing I just used to keep everything to myself because again the the environment I grew up in was not one where I could thrive in in terms of expressing my feelings mm-hmm. without me uh feeling without my feelings being invalidated. I signed up for counseling, I, you know, show up on time and you know I must so what has brought you here and you know I'm just like yo I have a lot to say a lot <laughs> and it's mostly from my childhood. that has now caught up with me and I don't know what to do I'm just finding myself sometimes in very awkward situations and me not knowing how to deal it's some to some people it's as simple as Edgar just tell the person not that you don't like this and I didn't know how to do that mm-hmm. so it's like I was an adult but I was a child at the same time so the counseling was a bust though you know it's just the counselor asking me tell me what has brought you here and then don't worry you'll be good let's see you in one week and then I'd go back see you in one week and i only got four sessions because the school had like three counselors and the school what how many students were we man that school was like a small town i swear to god that wow. campus was a small town yeah. so you're looking at way over 20k 20k 30k people studying at any given point in time in that one campus and you have three counselors can't work and i had a really you know when i signed up i had i had this like light at the end of the tunnel that i was seeing because i'm like okay i'm first away from home I can talk to people who don't know me so it yeah. be easy for me to express myself and then you know it's the western world and these guys even in the movies they show more compassion you know when someone is struggling with whatever yeah. so me going through all that that was a bust for me so uh, I was just like fuck it man I don't care mm-hmm. I just I, I after the sessions were done I didn't sign up again um because that tell me oh you have it's way overbooked you know we're serving so many people I, I lost interest So I I just I went through with my uni I finished I came back to Kenya and now is me like okay now I've come back I need to settle down I need to find what I'm going to do work wise because I had this uh I was so focused when I came back and I wanted my life to go in a very strict path I my mind would not stop racing mm-hmm. I was overthinking from through the day throughout the night so I wasn't sleeping very well maybe 2 to 3 hours a night yeah. and the 2 to 3 hours a night that I was I was sleeping I wouldn't call it, I didn't call it sleeping it was more like blacking out mm-hmm. my mind had gone on overdrive and then it just shut down and then so I wasn't sleeping very well I wasn't eating very well once a day to once every two days mm-hmm. and then it got to points where I was only eating after I puked bile so I mean damn this I was I was going through it I was going through the most 
But remember, I have no voice. Who am I telling? Yeah. Catch our next African stories in the next episode. Whew, that's a roller coaster of a story. And part two is going to be in next week's episode of Legally Clueless. So make sure you're here to hear that. I love that he starts talking about the physical ways in which mental situations can manifest. Because I've had this conversation with so many of my friends. And most recently, a friend of mine was telling me she was working in a really toxic workspace. And she just started blacking out, you know, having migraines and just physical issues. Whenever she'd go to the hospital, they're like, imagine we cannot find anything wrong with you. And for me, it reminds me of towards the end of my stint on traditional radio, I was very unhappy and I didn't like the space that I was working in. And my voice just used to disappear like all the time. <laughs> all the time right so apparently i've been reading up online and it can be linked to um anxiety issues as well because sometimes my voice would go and i I wasn't having any throat issues or any flu like it just up and went for a walk somewhere (laughs) and just left me voiceless so i love that edgar's story um brings that out So next week, part two of his story is going to be in the episode. That's going to be episode 23 next week. Yes. Yep. My math has not failed me. Um, But I just need to remind you that if you want to share your story in some childhood trauma that you have, maybe it's something you experienced when you were a kid or something that you witnessed and you can see how it has affected you now you can share that story on our whatsapp number so you can just record a voice note or a whatsapp voice note the number is plus two five four seven six eight six two eight seven nine zero i'll put it in the caption as well and yeah i'll see how i can work in your stories and edgar's part two in the next episode also remember to join our insta tribe at legally clueless podcast i am so happy that you're part of the tribe and that you're enjoying this podcast i'm enjoying creating it for you and that's it for this episode of legally clueless you can share this podcast with your friends you can keep it for yourself i'm not judging just make sure you're here next week for the next episode